So I, I really don't, uh, I really don't believe in coincidences. I mean, and the reason I don't really believe in coincidences is because God knows everything. So he knows every hair on your head. He knows every thought. And we'll get a little bit more detail into that as we get into the message. But he knows every thought. He knows everything about you. Amen. He knew you. Now, let's, you, know, you need to put some thought behind this. He knew you before you were in your mother's womb. Amen. Right? So he knew what you were going to do, when you were going to do it. So when we... Uh, when Brother Tim asked me to preach, it hadn't been that long ago since I preached, so the last time I did preach, I hope I can remember all this, uh, I preached on duty versus desire. And I told my wife, I don't know whether she believed it or not, but I had seven more points to preach that night. So I said, I hope I get an opportunity to preach these again. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to finish the last message I preached to you. Um, so the last message I did preach to you was on duty versus desire. Uh, before we go into that, you'll be in uh, Acts uh, chapter 8, talking about duty versus desire. But before we get there, I want to read to you and... Uh, kind of expound on just a little bit about not where we are, but where we're headed. And where we're headed in First Thessalonians chapter 4 is, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Verse 15, For this we say unto you, that the word of the Lord which which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. And obviously 16, 17, 18 are very familiar verses. For the Lord himself shall defend, descend from heaven with a, what did he preach about this morning? Shout. So I couldn't help but think about that, brother, as you were preaching this morning. Uh, the Lord himself. Amen. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Amen. What does it say about us? Then we, which are alive, we're alive and remain, we're still remaining, shall be caught up in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord so What's that last verse say? Wherefore comfort one another with these words. Amen. So when you're facing adversity, and a lot of us are, uh, the surgeries and the aches and the pains, and, and all, there's always, first of all, there's always somebody facing a little bit more and a little bit tougher adversity than you are. Yeah, I don't, I don't care what you're facing. Uh, but whatever you're facing, uh, this is where it'll end, right here. If you're dead, you'll be, you'll rise first. If you're alive, you'll be caught up in the air. And then so shall we all ever be with the Lord. Amen. Hmm. Amen. Comfort one another with these words. So tonight we're going to uh, try to preach a little bit about a sovereign God. And, and you know, <laughs> before we even go there, I, yes, I know that the word, did you know? that the word sovereign is not in the King James Bible. Hmm. Now, we've heard that a lot, haven't we? Yes. We've heard about the sovereignty of God, right? Hold on, I'm going somewhere with it. So we'll talk about the sovereignty of God. We'll talk about the sovereign God, the supreme God, the satisfying God, the sacrificing God, the suffering God, and the saving God. Uh, so we'll, we'll kind of springboard backwards and then we'll get into that at the end of where I, where I le last left off at. What we do, we'll pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to stand behind uh, your sacred desk. Father, I pray, Lord God, I don't say anything that you wouldn't have me to say, Lord. I pray, Lord God, that I say everything that you would have me to say, and I pray, Lord God, that you preach this message and that I just be a messenger. 
Heavenly Father, go with me, lead me, guide me, and direct me. Lord God, I do pray if there's any lost soul in the house tonight that they sincerely uh, come to you and trust you as their Lord and Savior. Pray, Lord God, for being lost, uh, any soul in the house tonight that's not lost, but that needs you to get through what they're going through. I pray, Lord God, that you just be with them and give them the peace that passes all understanding. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we started out, and, and really it, it's kind of a mission-minded uh, sermon, but it, we need to be mission-minded. Uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, I gave you a little, a little number to think about. I don't know if you thought about it or not, but if you didn't, I, I do want you to put some thought into the fact uh, that the population four years ago uh, in Taiwan is 23,568,378 people of which 99% of those folks are probably lost, dying, and going to hell. So I need you to put thought into how, and listen, that's just Taiwan. That's not uh, in Beijing. That's not, what is it, 20, 30 million in there. That's not in Dayan. That's not in Harbin. That's not in South Africa. That's not in Africa. That's not in Mozambique. That's and and all of, there's multiple missionaries that I'm associated with, and most of those guys uh, worked for me. A lot, if not all of those guys, worked for me at one point. And so I think about that, and I think about how God brought them to me to fill my need, and now how I can help fill their need by supporting them. And you. You know, it's not just a financial support, more so it's a prayerful support. You need to pray for their safety. You need to understand that they don't live like you live where you can go out those doors and hand out a track. They could actually go to prison and have and are in prison as we speak for handing out a track. Uh, when I say and I request prayer for Pastor LeBron and Pastor Charles and Pastor Mark, that's exactly what they're doing. And the last I heard, Pastor Mark was in prison. And a lot of those guys get beat. It's not a fable, it's a truth. A lot of those guys get beat uh, to a pulp, right? And so we all need to be diligent uh, as we do go out those doors right there to give the gospel of Christ. And I, I earlier said that we all face adversity. And, you know, in my business, I meet a lot of people and I see a lot of things. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm share a little bit of testimony with you. I'm doing a job in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And uh, as I'm doing my job, as it probably never fails, someone comes across and asks for a business card. Uh, because they want to keep up with the Joneses or whatever the case may be. It doesn't hurt my feelings in him. I mean, it's business for us. And so the gentleman came. He's a very nice gentleman. He came, asked for a business card. Uh, I told my son to give him one. He told me he didn't have one. That didn't surprise me either. And, uh, but he did tell him they were ordered, and he didn't lie. They were ordered. And uh, so he's kind of taken over my company, so he's just decided to change uh, everything but anyway that's that's him and uh, so at the end of the job uh, right before the job ended I seen some gentlemen pull up in front of that house and I, I happened to notice and they were dressed uh, brother Rick like uh, uh, an undercover agent should be dressed right so they were dressed for uh, trying to make you not think that they were a law enforcement officer but I seen the badge on the side, and uh, as I seen the badge, they went to the gentleman's house next door that come and asked me to give him a bid. And I thought, hmm, uh, I don't know. Should I go over there, should I not? So then come another one, and then came another one, and then there was three of them. And then they went over, and they first thing they did, they put on uh, blue latex gloves. And I thought, hmm. So remember, when I started this, I told you I don't believe in coincidences, right? 
I don't believe things are just for, for a coincidence. I don't believe, well, that just happened by coincidence, no. So they went in, and they did whatever they did, were going to do, and they came out, and they left. And so this guy lives across the street, so the neighbor right next to the job I was doing was there, and I asked her, hey, uh, yeah, I'm kind of blunt. What's up, you know, with your neighbor? I mean, is everything okay? Uh, I feel safe going over there or whatever. And she said, yeah, they're, they're good people. They just have a wayward daughter. And I said, hmm, okay. So I went and I gave the man a bid. And, I mean, just boom, he just accepted it like no questions asked. And uh, so it, it was kind of a, it was a really tough job. And so my son kind of looked at me like, you know, and I said, yeah, we, we're going to do this job. And so... I called in, called Zach to schedule it, and we, we set it up, and I called the man, and he said, that'll be great. And so I went, and he said, I need to add a couple of things to what I ask you to do. And so last Thursday, I went to his house. And Zach said, why are you going to his house? We'll just do whatever he asks us to do. I said, no, I just need to go to his house. I need to see. But see, it's not by coincidence, right? So I went to his house on Thursday night, and we discussed the job and what needed to be added and what needed to be done. And he said, now my son will be here tomorrow and he may not be in his right mind at this present time. Now remember now, this is where the officers came and the undercover agents. Right after we left, two hours after we left, there were six more cops, two fire trucks and the ambulance came. Now, the reason they came is because the first group of gentlemen that had came had came to administer Narcan. Everything worked, and they left. The second group of emergency vehicles came to pick up his 17-year-old daughter who passed away. I can't, I can't imagine those circumstances, right? Now, this is the grandfather. He's 75 years old that I'm talking to. It's his granddaughter. And they all lived in, in the same house. So I went, I went, and I knew, you know, at, at that point and that time, I'll, I'll be back tomorrow. Maybe I shouldn't have did that. Maybe I should have just hit the situation right on, but I had to judge what was going on and the circumstances around it at the time. So I went home Thursday night and I prayed. For, these, for, for this family, and I ask you to continue to pray for this family. And I went back the next day, and he came out, and he said, well, y'all are doing such a good job, and da-da-da-da, da-da-da. And I said, oh, I said, sir, he said, let me go to the bank, and uh, I'll be right back. And I said, no. I said, is your son here? And he said, yes. And so I got his son. And there in the front yard, while the people working for us were in the backyard doing the, the work, my job was to do my job was to tell him about Jesus. And that's what I did. And I asked him, and I gave him and his son, and they said, yes, we, we know God. And so I kind of anticipated that they knew there was a God. And so I asked him, but do you know God? And then I began to share John 3.16 and John 3.17 and John 3.18. And through the Bible, and through the Bible we went, and the son's head began to drop. And he was a gentleman I could tell that did not cry. He just, he, maybe he didn't have any tears left. But he, he bowed his head, and he said, yes, sir, I'm saved. And he gave a testimony. And to the best of my knowledge, his testimony was pure and true. And his grandfather gave a testimony. And his grandfather... So I'm sure you thought I was going to say these gentlemen got gloriously saved, but that's, that's not the point of the message. Right. The point of the message is for us to give the gospel. It's not that we can save anybody, and praise God they were saved according to their testimony that they gave me. But the one thing that he said 
Out of every, normally they'll tell you to do a good job, bad job, happy, sad, whatever. Well, that's fine as long as you pay me. But the one thing that he said was, thank you. This is what the sun came out. And he said, thank you for ministering to me. And I said, no, sir, thank you for letting me. So you have opportunities. But you have to take advantage of every opportunity that God puts in front of you. And if not, then you need to pray that God will open your eyes and your ears to every, every E-B-E-R-Y, every opportunity that God gives you. Because where he places you is not by coincidence. So where he places you is one thing. What you do with it is another. So in China, they're given, I'm 100% I'm convinced, they're given the gospel on a daily basis. In South Africa, all across the universe, and we'll talk about the universe, but are we right here in the heart of the Bible Belt? Are we given the gospel? Because there's multiple people right here that are just as lost as those people in China, as those people in Africa. So I didn't mean to stray on that, but I, I thought it was something that needed to be said. So we'll pick up in verse 26 of Acts chapter 8. And to backtrack a little bit, we talked, when I preached uh, this message originally, we talked about the ministry of Philip, and we talked about the first missionaries, and we talked about doing things out of desire, fulfilling our duty, but doing our duty out of desire. So in verse 26, and the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, the way uh, that goeth down to Jerusalem, unto Gaza, which is in the desert. And he arose and went, and we said, When the Lord speaks, we need to arise and go. This is what Philip did. He arose and went. If you look at Abraham, when God spoke to Abraham, he arose and went. And he went to sacrifice. God told him, go kill your son. And he said, yes. And he went up. And, you know, he was faithful. He was faithful to do what God asked him to. Philip is faithful to do what the angel of the Lord asked him to do. And he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch, of great authority under Queen or under Candace, Queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasure. So, well, we talked and we talked a little bit about, and we'll talk a whole lot about, or not a whole lot, what time allows. We'll talk about laying up your treasures in heaven where rust and moth does not corrupt. So, this man. Probably, according to what I read in Scripture, had great material wealth. So, a lot of times we focus on what we're going to get materially or our material wealth. Or our wealth and where it's going to be when it's time for us to where we can't work anymore. Or 401ks or whatever. But the Bible teaches us to lay up our treasures in heaven. So your treasures in heaven is going to be how many people you led to Christ or told about Christ or how many seeds you planted. It won't be about what you got materially, materialistic things. Lay your treasures up with eternal things, uh, not temporal things. So this man, in verse 8, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Esaias as the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to the chariot. And Philip ran, and we talk about that showed Philip's determination, but that showed Philip's desire, not just his duty. He knew what he had to do, and lots of times we know what we're supposed to do, but do we have the desire to do it with? Are we excited when God asks us to go do something? Are we excited when we see an opportunity to witness to somebody? When, when you're going through and you have an opportunity, that opportunity is probably when he says that'll be $97.50 for your one bag of groceries. Boom. But you've got an opportunity to give him a track right there. Your opportunity, you know how many people, how many tracks have been received off of people that go get a tank of gas? A bunch. And I'll tell you why. Because every time I get gas, I'll say, 
I, I might have forgot one somewhere. So I'll be real careful But when I say every time. But every time I go to get gas, I take that gas head on the stick that track right into the next person that's going to get gas at that pump. And you can put you, multiple opportunities for you to witness. Amen. That's just a few. Verse 29, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go and join thyself to the chariot. And Philip ran with enthusiasm. The Bible does not say with enthusiasm, but I'm sure he did. If he ran, he had to be enthusiastic about it. Yeah. Then to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? So many people know God, but do they know God? Do they know about Jesus? Do they know God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? Have they been saved? It, let me cut to the chase for you real quick. I, sir, have you ever been saved? And that's what I asked those two gentlemen. And then if they don't give a clear testimony, then you, you go as God directs. But you plant that seed. Paul planted. Apollos watered. God gives the increase. God will give the increase. And it not, might not be that day. It might be five years down the road. But it might be off the seed you planted five years ago. So keep planting the seed. Have a desire to serve the Lord. And he said, how kind of except some man should guide me. And he what? He desired. He desired. So Philip had a desire to go give to a man that had a desire to receive. Amen. So you don't know who you're talking to when you're talking to them. Just always steer that conversation toward Christ, toward Jesus, toward the plan of salvation. That he would come up and sit with him in the place, in verse 32, the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, Isaiah 53. And like a lamb, dumb before his shears, so opened he not his mouth. And in his, uh, verse 33, in his humiliation, and his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare this generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee. There's his desire again. I pray thee. Of whom speaketh the prophet this of himself or some other man? Now, it's real complicated right here, verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth. First thing you gotta do is open your mouth. Right? You gotta open your mouth and begin at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Amen. Just go preach Jesus. You're not guaranteed the next breath that you take. I, start, I labor to breathe most of the time. I have a current 85% blockage in a major artery. I've had three heart attacks, four bypasses, a trip on Lifestar, two people pumping on my chest, eight stents, 13 heart surgeries. I'm just saying. And yes, I put up 10 yards of mulch right but you get up. My, my desire, I promise you, is not to go landscape somebody's yard. But it presents the opportunity to present the gospel. So whatever you do, it doesn't matter. Whether you work, whether you don't work, wherever you go, wheresoever you go, preach Jesus. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be a preacher. Everybody should preach Jesus. Amen. Wherever you go, be a witness for Christ. Verse 36, And as they went on their way and came, and came unto a certain water, that's going to blow your baptism salvation out of water. As they came to the water, the eunuch said, See, here is water. See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, and I preached a message one time on belief. And you can go here, and you can go a hundred other scriptures, and you're going to see believe, 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 believe. What does hinder me? Believe, 
What does hinder me? Believe. Did he say, oh, well, you got to confess all your sins? No. Does Romans 10, 9 say, confess all your sins? Well, I'll be honest with you, oh, there was a time in my life I thought that's what that meant. I thought that I was supposed to repent of my sins. You know what's wrong with telling somebody that i got to repent of your sins? A, what if you forget one? B, if I'm lost and I don't know what you know, or I don't know what you know, and I come down to this altar to get saved, and you tell me i got to repent of my sins, the you know, first thing I'm thinking is, no, this ain't going to work. Now, you just don't know. How many times have you heard, you don't know what I've done? You just don't know what I've done. Nowhere in this scripture did this Ethiopian eunuch say, or Philip tell him that he had to repent of his sins. He said, if thou believest. He said, if thou believest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We're done. Look at the next verse. And when they were come up out of the water, oh, excuse me, and he commanded the chariot to be still, be still. And they went down both into the water. This is after he said what? Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He went down the water, and then he got baptized. Verse 39. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went, now this is the eunuch on his way rejoicing, but it's also Philip. Philip rejoiced because he had the opportunity. The eunuch rejoiced because Philip had the opportunity. Amen. And Philip seized upon the moment. Right. He seized upon the opportunity. So what you got to ask yourself, are you seizing? Are you ceasing? I don't know if I pronounced that right or not. Upon the opportunity. How many opportunities are you leaving on the table? When I flew to South Africa, I was able to lead a young lady in the airport to Christ. When I flew to Taiwan, I'm not tooting my own horn either. I'm just trying to get you to understand that God puts in front of you people that will tell you, well, I'll just confess my sin to the priest in Detroit, Michigan. Well, isn't getting saved about Mary. And by the time he, he pushed me in a wheelchair from one end of the airport to the other, and I promise you I would not have made it had he not, then I was able to tell and preach unto him about Jesus. And when he got to the end, he got saved. Amen. He asked Jesus to come into his heart and save him. I also witnessed to a lady right across at the concession whatever, to get something to eat. And she did not get saved. So they don't all get saved. But they all should be with, They all should have the opportunity. The only way they're going to have the opportunity is for you to be a witness for Christ. So when they went on their way rejoicing, and Philip, he did what he did. You know, I'm going to give you seven points in eight minutes. So I'm going to preach it quick. You listen quick, we'll be done quick. They did what they did because God is a sovereign God. So it's not in the King James Bible, the word sovereign. I get all that. I read all the blogs and, and did my due diligence and study. But let me define sovereign for you. So we'll pick up where we just left off. So this is why I think God is a sovereign God. Because God, uh, sovereign is defined as highest. Amen. Well, I, he don't get no higher than God to me. So if I stop right there, he's a sovereign God. Amen. First of all, let me tell you, he is a sovereign God. He is the highest of the highest. He is supreme. Another definition of the word sovereign. Used as an adjective. Here I go, Tom is smart again. I don't even know what an adjective is. Most. Used as an adjective. Our, and this is in the dictionary now. In the dictionary. Used as an adjective, as their example, our most sovereign Lord, the King. That's what it says. So, you ask me, is God sovereign? Yes. 
you ask me, is God sovereign? I'll tell you what the Bible says in Job 42, verses 1 and 2. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything. He didn't say canst thought. He said canst. That means can do. I know that thou can do everything. And that, what did we talk about to start out with? No thought can be. Now you need to chew on this right here, and I'm preaching to me. That no thought can be withholden from thee. He knows your every thought. So what comes out of your mouth sometimes may be opposite of what's in your mouth. You may say the right things. You may do the right things out of duty. But is your mind right with God? Or your thoughts? So what does the Bible say that defile? It's not what goes in, but what comes out of your heart. It's not what comes out of your mouth, what comes out of your, not what goes in your mouth, but what comes out of your heart. Because what's in your heart is what should come out of your mouth. Lots of times it does, and lots of times that gets us in trouble. That's Job 42, verses 1. Until you ask me why is a sovereign God, I'll tell you because Psalms 115 says, Not unto us, O Lord, but unto thy name give glory. For thy mercy, thy mercy, and thy truth's sake. Verse number 2. Where in Psalms 115, verse number 2. Wherefore should the heathen say, where is now their God? Verse number 3. But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he pleased. My God is a sovereign God. It also says, the Bible says, in the sovereign God, God being sovereign, 1 Chronicles 29, 10 through 12, wherefore David blessed the, uh, wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation, blessed be thou the Lord God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. Amen. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness of and thy power, and thy glory, and thy majesty, for all that is in all, all that is in heaven, and in earth, is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art, thou art exalted above all. Verse number 12, Both riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all. And in, thou what? Reignest over all. And thy hand is power. And, and in thy hand is power and might. And in thy hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. So you ask, is God sovereign? My God is. Because he's the highest God. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's the God of gods. There is no other God. There may be statues. There may be Buddha. There may be Bahamut. There may be other things that other people worship. But there is only one God. Amen. Only one. He is also God supreme. The definition of supreme superior to all others. So you ask me, is my God supreme? My God is superior to all others. Amen. He made the supreme sacrifice. Defined. Supreme God. Defined as highest in authority. Now, this dictionary definition of supreme will give uh, about Congress and about the government and so forth. So I'll just read for the sake of time the last part of the definition of supreme. Uh, in the universe, God only. This is a dictionary. In the universe, God only is the supreme ruler and judge. Amen. His commandments are supreme and binding on all his creatures. In order to have creatures, you've got to have a creator. Amen. Right. He is supreme. He is sovereign. He's also... Uh, supreme in the fact 
And if I gave you no other scripture, just one verse. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He's supreme. He's sovereign. He's supreme. First Corinthians, to tell me that God is my supreme God. First Corinthians 15, 28. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him, that put all things under him, that God may be all and all. So what do we say? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He's all and all. He's one. He's God supreme. He's also God supreme in Philippians 2, verses 9 and 11. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name. Now listen, and given him a name which is above every, and I even wrote in my notes, every name. Amen. There is no other name. It's God. It's God. Above every name. Verse 10, that all the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in the heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth. Above the earth, under the earth, and things in the earth. He's above all of that. He is God supreme. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The glory of God the Father. He's a supreme God. He's a sovereign God, a supreme God. He's also a satisfying God. Amen. Philippians 3.8 says, Yea, doubtless, and this is Paul speaking, but I want you to make application unto your own life about the things we talked about earlier, about the materialistic things in your life, and about how much you've got to worry about tomorrow. Because if I'm not mistaken over there in Matthew, somewhere around the, and I might be wrong, 6th chapter, uh, toward the end of the chapter, 33 maybe, or on up from that, I'm sorry, where it says, why take you thought for the things of tomorrow, because tomorrow will take care of the things of itself. God will take care of that. He can take care of all your needs because he's a sovereign God, because he's a, a supreme God, and because he's a satisfying God. But this is what Paul says. He says, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellent excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord and whom I have suffered the loss of all things so if you lose everything you got tonight but you have Christ you've lost nothing but you've gained everything because you lost temporal things and you gained eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ with God Almighty I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them, but what? Dumb! I just said, the Bible says, Paul said, I count them, but dumb! They mean nothing! 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 There's nothing you can do, say, or show me that will take the place of Christ. So if I take that last breath here, I'll take that first breath there. Amen. Don't cry for me. You celebrate. Celebrate. Verse 9. And be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is of the what? The law. But that which is through faith, of Christ, the righteousness, which is of God by faith. And I got my notes. See, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Everybody here knows what 2, 8, 9 says. It says, for by grace, grace, you know that man that just lost his daughter? That man that just lost his granddaughter two weeks ago? Did I tell you she was 17 years old? 17. Did I tell you my wife's nephew, of whom I count as my nephew? 
died the exact same way with a syringe wrapped around as they found him in a closet? Did I tell you that? But did so he lost everything, including his life, for a drug. But years and years and years earlier, I took the Bible and I went to Jefferson County Jail. And that young man accepted Christ as his Savior. And I know where Lance is today. A hundred percent convinced of it. When he got saved, he called his mom and missed his sister. He said, I just got saved. He, he asked for a Bible. Huh? So, yes, there's consequences to sin. So, he was involved in some things he didn't need to be involved with. But when he got saved, he got saved. Now, this young lady, I don't know. I know not. I didn't feel the need to go there. But that man, this is what he said to me. that gave me a clear testimony of his faith. He said, by grace, I am saved through faith. Not of works should any man boast. I, yes, sir. He's a satisfying God in John 14 and 15, verse 4. And I'll wrap this up. But whosoever drinketh of the water, he's a satisfying God. When you're thirsty, he'll give you drink. But if I give you drink, you'll thirst again. But if he gives you drink, you shall never thirst again. Because he'll give you eternal life. So we know about John 4, 14 and 15. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Amen. And what did the woman say? She said, Sir, give me this water. And she got saved. You want to know the very first thing she did? She ran with desire and said, Come see a man that told me all things ever I knew. It's not this, the Messiah. What she do? She believed. Believed. Jesus told her to go get her husband. She said, I have not a husband. She said, he said, and that you say, that's right, you got five of them. So he knows your ever thought. Don't worry about your past. Don't worry about your present. Worry about your future. Because he will save you from your past, from your present, and from your future. Brother Tim.